could you tell me a little bit about the model that you use to try to project different future uh, climate states based on the kind of decisions that people and organizations make now and, uh, and in particular for myself and for my audience because I've got more of a physical science background a lot of my listeners are uh, researchers in physics uh, the physical background uh, physical sciences and maybe some of the you know biogeochemical type sciences so I think for me and perhaps for many of them I don't have a very good sense of how one gets uh, psychological knowledge, social psychology knowledge, economic knowledge, you know, into a quantitative model that makes quantitative pro projections. That's an area that I've, I feel pretty ignorant in, actually. And if, if you could highlight a bit of how that is done, that would be really helpful, too, as you described sure. the model. Sure. So it's a great question. So my original training is in uh, a field we call system dynamics, which is the application of nonlinear dynamical theory, control theory, feedback systems uh, to, in my, in my case, uh, to human systems. So many of your listeners will be trained in physical sciences or engineering and are familiar with control theory or um, positive and negative feedbacks that drive the dynamics of complex systems. We're doing exactly the same thing using the same mathematics, uh, the same simulation methods, but we're applying those tools to human systems like companies, markets, societies, uh, and environmental problems like the climate problem. Um, so I'll give you an example, not about climate to start out with. Uh, I've been doing some work with uh, colleagues, Professor uh, Hajir Rahmandad and one of our doctoral students, uh, Tseyang Lim, uh, modeling the COVID pandemic. And of course, there are many models uh, that have come out since the virus emerged, uh, and most of them are in what's known as the SEIR family, susceptible, exposed, infected, and removed. Those are the state variables or the states of progression from you don't have it, then you were infected, but you're pre-symptomatic, the disease is in the incubation period, then you're infected and uh, infectious, and then you either recover or die and are removed from the pool of mm. people who either could have or do have an active infection. Um, so those models are, are great. They go back many, many decades. They're widely used, but the traditional models don't include human behavior. It's as if you were um, you know, an animal in the forest with no ability to change your behavior. And that's clearly not the case. So what we have done is we've developed a system dynamics model of the pandemic in which human behavior plays an important role. So what does that mean? It means that, for example, once the disease emerges and uh, people become aware of it, become afraid of it, their behavior changes. We went into self-imposed isolation. We started wearing masks, we distance when we're outside, we wash our hands and use other hygiene practices more frequently. And that feeds back to change the hazard rate of becoming infected. Um, so in our model, we, we include an endogenous treatment of how people perceive the risk, not only the risk of getting COVID, of getting the SARS, um, COVID-2 virus, but of, uh, of harm from it, of dying. And so as evidence emerges as the information about how many people have it, how many people have had it, and how many people have died, that increases people's fear, increases their risk, uh, their perceived risk. And that takes time, so we model the time delay there. And then that drives their responses. and uh, that creates a very powerful negative feedback loop if the responses are strong enough such that the um, incidence and eventually prevalence of active cases will fall, not because the epidemic has run its course, but because people change their behavior. There's also a very powerful feedback in which people who uh, find themselves living in a hotspot flee 
Uh, this happened in New York City, it happened in Italy, it happened in the UK, it happens all over the world. Uh, so if they have the ability, they leave and they often will take the virus unknowingly with them yeah, and I start see. outbreaks in other areas. These behavioral feedbacks have been shown in work we and others have done to be very, very powerful and important in conditioning the evolution of an epidemic, uh, at least as powerful, if not more important in shaping the course of an epidemic than differences in the uh, structure of the social contact network. And that's because it's changing the social contact network. Right. So what we did, what we did was we, we um, estimated our model for every country in the world that has at least a thousand cases and publishes sufficient data on their testing every day uh, for us to estimate the parameters. We're using, I don't want to get too technical, but uh, we're using a hierarchical Bayesian estimation uh, method with uh, what's known as a random effects framework so that the parameters for each country are constrained to some extent by the parameters in other countries, hmm. by the experience of the other countries. And that dramatically increases the power of the, or the size of the sample that we can use to estimate the parameters and gives us more accurate estimates. Uh, so what we're able to do then is estimate the true number of cases and the actual number of deaths from COVID-19, uh, which is extraordinarily important because we know that the confirmed case data and the confirmed mortality data are significantly underestimating the true situation. But nobody knows by how much. So what our model does is it allows you to include these behavioral feedbacks, which shape the pattern of the epidemic. This is why you've got these initial rapid outbreaks, followed by, in most nations, not all, a peak and a decline. And then in many nations, because it seems to be declining, people's perceived risk erodes mm -hmm. and they open up their economy again and they start going out and bars and restaurants open up and they stop wearing masks as much and then you get a rebound outbreak mm -hmm. uh, because the risk has eroded. And that that's included in the model. And if you don't do that, you can't adequately replicate or explain what's been happening in many, many countries around the world, including the United States, Iran, Mexico, India. I mean, it, it's really an essential piece of the story. So um, just uh, uh, the, the bottom line of that work, which is out as a preprint, it's under review right now. So your readers need to know it hasn't been published yet. It's going through peer review right now, but it's still just a preprint and people can find it online. Um, the bottom line is we estimate that across those 86 nations, which span almost 5 billion people in the world, um, the true number of cases we estimate is about 10 and a half times greater than the confirmed case count, which is a very substantial under-reporting wow. ratio. Yeah. And mortality is about 50% higher than reported. And that means that the uh, infection fatality rate, which is the conditional probability that if you get it, you will die, on average across those nations is 0.65%, which is very consistent with other estimates from specific countries or specific populations. Now that risk of death varies dramatically with age, right, and right. we find that also. Um, but it also varies dramatically with the capacity of the hospital and treatment system. So we know that, for example, in Italy, the uh, fatality rate has been very, very much higher than average. Um, and that's not just because the population of Italy um, skews older than many other nations. It's because people simply couldn't get into the hospitals. They were overwhelmed. So that's another endogenous social feedback that conditions the outcomes. Um, and uh, I mean, this is a long example, but uh, it, it gives a little bit of an idea of how you capture the human behavior that creates important feedback dynamics 
uh, in a, in a uh, formal simulation model. And yes, yeah. generally speaking, those human dynamics matter tremendously, and not just in the COVID situation, but in, in most systems. Right, yeah. So you, you partially answered one of the questions that I had was, when you're defining this dynamical system to represent a population and some state of that population, I was picturing all of the parameters in those equations, right? Every term has multiple parameters and they all have to be estimated and they all right. will have uncertainties. And so um, not knowing anything in my mind coming from the, the physical world, physical modeling world, where we certainly do have lots of parameters, it's almost intimidating to think about like, gosh, if you try to include human behavior and include all these other factors that just increases the number of parameters, um, you know, but pretty dramatically. Well, uh, yes and no, right? Some of the models we build are, are um, simple. I mean, just as in the earth sciences in the climate area, we have the huge, uh, you know, integrated AOGCMs with biosphere, ocean atmosphere feedbacks and cryosphere dynamics and all of that. And those models are gigantic. They're, you know, those are the, I think they're the biggest models anywhere in the world. And they, mm -hmm. they, they can only be run successfully on, you know, enormous supercomputer clusters. Yeah, they have yeah. a lot of parameters. But you also have Earth system models of intermediate complexity and simple models, Earth system models uh, uh, that are uh, much, much smaller aggregated uh, low dimensional compartment models. Uh, and each of those different models has its own purpose. You know, there's never a question of which one is right. All models are wrong. Some might be useful, as George Box famously said. Uh, and the really important thing here is each model needs to be suited for its particular purpose. So it's the same in the modeling we do. Um, some of the models we build are very large. Our COVID model is very large, has a lot of parameters, um, and we're able to estimate those uh, and assess the confidence intervals or the credible intervals uh, around, around those estimates. Um, we use Markov chain Monte Carlo for that um, and do a variety of other sensitivity tests. And we do synthetic data experiments where we take the model, give it parameters that are reasonable, run the model with noise, process and measurement noise. And then since we know the so-called ground truth in that model, we can then estimate the parameters using our estimation method and see if we not only get the right parameters, but the right confidence intervals or credible intervals around them. And yeah, so we do. Um, but we also build these very, very simple low dimensional models. And in fact, coming back to our climate models, our interactive climate policy models, and there are two main ones, C-ROADS, the Climate Rapid Overview and Decision Support System, and N-ROADS, the Energy Rapid Overview and Decision Support System. They are in the family of simple climate models, low dimensional treatment of the carbon cycle, the emissions, atmospheric stocks, removal fluxes for the other greenhouse gases, um, similar low dimensional representation of transfer of heat to the ocean, uh, transfer of greenhouse gas of carbon into the ocean, et cetera. Uh, so those models are far, far, far simpler than the big AOGCMs or the integrated assessment models that are used on the energy side. Right. And it's because the purpose of our model is fundamentally different. Uh, the, the large models, the AOGCMs, the IAMs are, of course, absolutely essential to make basic progress in understanding the dynamics of the climate, understanding how different policies might alter greenhouse gas emissions, and then you feed those into a climate model, you get some sense of what global average surface temperature might be going forward. Uh, those models are absolutely essential. We rely on them in our work, but they're quite inappropriate for policy work and education. And it's because they take too long to run and they're opaque to, I'll call them lay users. The source code is obscure. It's not that available. Um, and 
the cycle time for doing analysis is just far too long compared to the speed of policy or the needs of education. So I'll give you an example. Um, in 2013, 2014, um, the United States uh, negotiated a bilateral climate agreement with China. And uh, I was not personally involved, but uh, our model, CROS model was one, not the only, but one of the analytical support tools that the uh, Obama administration used to evaluate proposals that were coming from the Chinese. Uh, and you know, when it came down towards the end of that negotiation, the United States had a team in Beijing uh, negotiating on the ground there with the Chinese. And you know, every time a new proposal would come to them, they'd transmit it securely to the White House and uh, National Security Council climate team would assemble with other key national security and uh, administration officials. They'd see what the proposal was and then they would try to evaluate what would it do if the Chinese agreed to this pattern of emissions for China, for example, peaking their emissions by 2030, which was their 2015 pledge under the Paris Agreement, what would that mean? Uh, would that have a significant impact in reducing global emissions and climate impacts? Warming, for example, uh, is it something we could live with? And the, the proposals were coming in fast and furious. So you've got to be able to basically evaluate them immediately so the negotiation doesn't get bogged down. You can't say, well, you know, your new proposal is quite interesting and in three months we'll have an analysis That's right. uh, that we can use to give you a yes or a no. Yeah, you um, don't have time to submit it, it to the job work. queue so, on a high performance computing platform and wait for yeah. the results and wait for the no, analysis. You just, yeah. and, you know. um, plus, we've, we've um, designed the models and I'm happy to show them to you. They're freely available. All of your listeners out there can go to the website and get them all yeah. and try them themselves. Um, the models are designed to be usable by people who aren't PhD climatologists. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so what you've got is a difference in purpose that drives the difference in model architecture and interface design and speed. Right, right. What you're describing sounds a lot like um, there's a now classic paper by Isaac Held and where he describes the uh, model hierarchy in, in our field generally. And uh, he describes, basically what you've just described is that well at the very lowest level you have a very simple model with very few kind of moving parts so to speak. There are just a few knobs you can turn but you think it captures the kind of simplest zeroth order characteristics of whatever system it is you're interested in. And then there are different levels of complexity. You know, you can add levels of complexity as you go up the hierarchy until you get all the way to the really sophisticated uh, general circulation models like you're talking about or earth system models, which include the cryosphere and the biosphere. And um, one of the interesting points that he made in this, uh, I think it was in the bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, is he said that you can learn a lot by adding or taking away sources of complexity and seeing what happens, like how your system changes between those levels. So it's not just about having all of those levels available to you. It's also about, well, you can compare the behavior of one model at this level to the behavior. What happens when I add um, you know, different behavior in different countries, for example, what does that do to the picture? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I fully agree with that perspective. Uh, you know, it's, and it's because no model is true. All models are imperfect. Mm -hmm. Only the only the real world is itself. <laughs> All models are uh, approximations and simplifications, and yeah. all models have gaps and biases. And so, uh, you know, we often do sensitivity. We and all other models, modelers, do sensitivity analysis uh, by varying parameters. Uh, you know, within the credible intervals that capture the uncertainty in those parameters. Um, but, and that's essential, but that's only one kind of sensitivity analysis. It's also critical to do structural sensitivity analysis, which is what you just described. Mm -hmm. What happens if we alter the boundary of the model? 
simplify or add more detail? Does that change the critical conclusions in a way that's consequential? Uh, often that's far more important than parametric sensitivity analysis, although of course you have to do that too. Yeah, so what we've done specifically that I think sounds totally consistent with what you described is uh, our models are uh, in the family of uh, simple climate models. They're low dimensional. Uh, we, we don't have spatial disaggregation. We're not treating the atmosphere with 20 or 30 layers and so forth. We have, I think, a four layer ocean. <laughs> uh, not disaggregating by ocean basins, uh, et cetera. Um, but then what we do is we very carefully compare the behavior of the model and estimate the parameters so that it fits the historical data going back from 1850 through the most recent data for um, concentration of CO2, methane, and the other GHGs in the atmosphere, uh, sea level rise, uh, global surface temperatures, et cetera. And then we we're using the model for policy design. And so it runs through 2100. And to make sure its future behavior is consistent with the other models, we carefully compare how our model behaves to, for example, the integrated assessment models that are out there. Um, and the way we do that, of course, is we look at, well, what used to be, you know, the RCPs and today the uh, shared socioeconomic pathway scenarios that, that are used uh, in IPCC analysis. And we make sure that our model goes through the middle of the envelope of the pathways for a wide set of the IAMs for each of those SSPs and within them for each of the different radiative forcing levels that they look at. And yeah. it does. Now, it's not perfect. Um, there are differences, of course, but there are, the difference between what our model trajectory is for each SSP uh, and any given IAM is no bigger and is often smaller than the difference across the IAM. So that gives us some confidence that we're consistent with the behavior of the big models, but then you've got our model being more suited for its purpose, which is giving people immediate feedback on what might happen if they try different actions and policies that would affect greenhouse gas emissions going forward. I'd be happy to show it to you, you know, we yeah. could. We could take a look live and you can you can see if you can save our climate going forward. So Yeah, that would be great. Can you tell people where they can go to the, the website? Yeah, so the En-ROADS model, which is the uh, most recent one, is available at enroads.org. So that's E-N hyphen R-O-A-D-S dot org. And I'm going to paste okay. that link into chat for you right Thank now. You. So good. if people go there, uh, the model's completely free. And from the website that comes up when you do that, you'll find uh, access to the simulator itself. You'll also find all of the documentation, uh, videos, training programs, um, curriculum uh, to use it with audiences as we mm -hmm. have done from middle school up through college, graduate school, and with senior policymakers and leaders in business and civil society around the world. I mm. think right now we've done interactive briefings for about 37 members of the United States Senate, about 60 members of the House of Representatives, seven governors, and uh, other folks on our team have uh, done similar briefings for a variety of elected leaders mm. uh, in countries around the world, Good. plus CEOs, C-suite folks, investors, other business leaders, and leaders in civil society. And um, so, uh, why don't yeah, I uh, why don't I describe what I'm looking at, and uh, we could because sure. we we could talk about 
you know, maybe releasing a segment of this in, in video form, but for the podcast, I can kind of describe what I'm looking at a little so bit. So why don't I walk you through the interface real quick, and then yes, you're yes. going to save the climate uh, by limiting expected warming to no more than two degrees C. How's that? <laughs> Let's give it a try. <laughs> All right. So uh, when you when you click into the main uh, screen on the interface, uh, what you see is uh, in this graph on the top left, global primary energy production by source from 2000 up through 2100. Uh, it's historical data up through the most recent. On the bottom, mm -hmm. we have coal, and then uh, that's, that's brown. Then the red band above that is oil. The blue one above that is natural gas. The green band above that are the uh, renewables, so that's hydro, wind, solar, geothermal, and the storage uh, for the variable renewables. Biomass on top of that and nuclear on top of that. Uh, the projection from 2020 onward is based on assumptions we've made about population, GDP per capita growth, the energy intensity of the economy, and the carbon intensity of the energy system. Uh, right. And so, go ahead. Oh, sorry, just had a little a little blip there. Yeah. So I notice in this in these projections, coal is projected to continue to increase in terms of its uh, the energy. Right. That it, that is generated from coal and uh, right. oil and these are all, as well. That's right. These are all things you can change. Let's back mm -hmm. up a second. Um, uh, the pattern of energy use that you see here in that graph on the left generates the pattern of greenhouse gas emissions that you see in the graph on the mm -hmm. right. So the green band at the bottom of this graph is emissions of uh, all greenhouse gases measured in CO2 equivalents uh, from land and land use change, forestry, et cetera. The big chunk, the biggest chunk in gray is the CO2 from combustion of fossil fuels, mm. the coal, oil, and natural gas that you see on the left. The, uh, the next band is the contribution from the fluorinated gases, uh, then methane, and then nitrous oxide on top of that. One thing I should tell you all is uh, the C roads model and the N roads model. Um, in this graph, we're showing CO2 equivalents, but we actually represent each gas separately in the model with its own emissions budget, its own atmospheric stock concentration, uh, removal flux, for example, as the CO2 is taken up by biomass or dissolves in the ocean, as the methane is oxidized, et cetera. And each one of those gases has its own contribution to radiative forcing. So of course, we're displaying them here using the 100-year global warming potentials that are standard in the IPCC work. But it's important for people to know that this is a real physics-based model with separate emissions, concentrations, mm -hmm. removal flux, and radiative forcing contribution yes. from each gas. And you know, it's CO2, it's methane, it's N2O, and I think we have over a dozen different species of fluorinated gases, sulfur hexafluoride, many different um, flavors of HFCs, PFCs, CFCs, because they vary in their atmospheric lifetimes and their, and their uh, radiative contribution. So, right. um, so what you see here is uh, total global primary energy grows through 2100, but at a diminishing rate. Uh, and because this is a reference case that assumes no additional climate policies beyond what's already been implemented, um, you do see a continued dominance of fossil fuels. And so emissions grow as well. And that carries the Earth system to an expected warming of uh, a little bit over four degrees C by 2100. And right. you can see that the trajectory of temperature, we crossed the one and a half degree threshold before 2030 and the two degree threshold before 2050. Yeah. So that's not good. That's no, going to be catastrophic for our prosperity, our health, and in many places, our lives. And your challenge is and you can vary the assumptions, right? So this is one scenario. Uh, if you're an aficionado, this is SSP2 
um, the middle socioeconomic shared socioeconomic pathway. Mm. We we're not going to do it right now, but you can vary all these assumptions and try out a lower um, energy, more renewably based pathway, even before climate policies, or one that's you know harder into the fossil fuels. Uh, mm. So, for example, we're using the UN median fertility population projection, which you see here. We're at about 7.6, 7.7 billion people on the planet right now. The UN median, uh, median fertility scenario carries us to uh, somewhat less than 11 billion by 2100. And here you can see it by region, with most of the growth happening in the developing nations. Uh, but you can change that. So, uh, for example, if you believe the demographic transition is going to happen faster than the UN believes, we can pull this slider and lower the population growth. And as you do that, uh, you see population is peaking earlier and actually dropping a little bit just due to lower fertility and the age structure of the global population. Uh, and with fewer people, there's less energy demand, fewer emissions, and the expected warming falls from 4.1 C to 3.9. Similarly, you could try higher population if you think that the demographic transition will not happen as fast as the UN thinks. And you can do the same thing with the other key assumptions, economic growth and GDP per capita. You vary that, you get dramatic changes in how much energy people are using and that mm. changes emissions and changes temperature. And one of the things you see here is, you know, I, I pull these sliders with my mouse and you immediately see the consequence. Yes. And that's, that's essential. People can't learn if the, the, there's a delay in that outcome feedback loop even as long as why don't you get a cup of coffee and when you come back the model results will be ready for you. That's just not going to work. Hmm. Um, so uh, if you don't like how much coal there is in the reference case, well you can change it. You know, pick, pick a different SSP or pick a different assumption about uh, the costs of renewables or um, other kinds of innovation in the reference case. Right. But let's work with this for right now. You're headed for catastrophe, 4.1 C of warming, 7.3 Fahrenheit by 2100. That has significant harmful consequences for humanity. For example, continued ocean acidification, sea level rise, Mm -hmm. uh, which you see here, well over a meter. Uh, and of course, as we discussed, all models are wrong in the sense that they're all imperfect approximations. So you can change a lot of the assumptions. So if you go up here to the simulation menu and you select assumptions, you've got a huge number of assumptions that you can vary. I'm dr drilling down into the climate system parameters. So here's climate sensitivity. Well, we're using three degrees C as the equilibrium long-term climate sensitivity. But as you know, there's continuing uncertainty and debate about it. It could be lower, it could be higher. Um, the current models are still running pretty hot. Maybe that'll get resolved, maybe it won't. So, uh, you know, if you think we might get very, very lucky, we could lower that, you know, maybe it's only 2.3. Well, then um, the expected warming is, 3.4 degrees. Well, we could get very unlucky. Suppose it's 4.5 degrees C. Well, then we're looking at 5.3 C by 2100. Right, and right. Much higher sea level rise going along with that. And, part and of in that the same fashion, you can change all these other parameters, uh, mixing of the ocean. So how quickly yeah. the carbon and the heat in the surface layer of the ocean is subducted to the deeper and abyssal layers, the strength of the CO2 fertilization feedback, uh, how much additional sea level rise from melting of Greenland and, and uh, Antarctica there might be compared to uh, the base estimate. And of course that has a dramatic impact on sea level rise and a variety of other parameters, including things that are still somewhat uncertain, like how much additional methane and CO2 will be emitted from melting permafrost and at what threshold temperature does that 
nonlinear effect really start to kick in. So those are some of the climate parameters. You can vary all of those. And then you've also got parameters about the energy system. What's the resource base of the fossil fuels? Um, what about the potential for carbon dioxide removal technologies like mineralization or direct air capture, uh, agricultural sequestration? What about afforestation? What about uh, how long it takes to develop and build and commission new plants like new nuclear plants or new solar facilities? Um, what's the progress ratio that conditions how much technological progress drives the marginal cost of all the different energy technologies down? And what about carbon capture and sequestration? So you can change a wide range of these assumptions and see what the effect is and do interactive sensitivity testing yes. as you go along. So one thing that uh, struck me just uh, as you were going through the climate sensitivity that, you know, you decreased the overall climate sensitivity by quite a lot. You pulled down the, the slider by you know, a, a good bit. Um, but the temperature projection that we were still looking at, uh, that we were looking at still went into a pretty catastrophic <laughs> range. Yeah, so well, I think that so. you know, maybe this debate isn't, or this um, part of the conversation isn't as prevalent as it used to be, but there used to be, um, well, there used to be uh, a school of thought who used to uh, hammer quite a lot on like, well, we don't know what the climate sensitivity is. Maybe it won't be so bad, but I was really struck by like, well, yeah, even if the sensitivity is lower than what we think it is, we're still not headed in a good direction. Right. Um, so yeah. this is a great observation. And so let's just do it again. If climate sensitivity was as low as two, hmm. um, you're still exceeding two degrees by about 2060 and you end up at around three uh, by 2100 and of course it's still rising. Now what's yeah. the probability of that? Well it's low, we don't know what it is. My feeling is if you're willing to assume that we might get very lucky, you really owe it to yourself to assume that or to look at the case where we're equally unlucky, that with yeah. the same probability uh, we, we uh, were unlucky. So that would be maybe four and a half degrees C <laughs> climate sensitivity. Some people think maybe even higher. Hmm. And now you're looking at 5.3 C by 2100 and exceeding the two degree threshold around 2030. So as Steve it's Schneider and many other people have pointed out for years, uncertainty here is not your friend. You don't <laughs> plan for uh, the expected case you need to plan for the plausible worst case. And uh, if you're willing to look at the low probability that we get really lucky, you really owe it to yourself to look at the lower probability that we're very unlucky. And when you do that, you find that, of course, emissions would need to fall even farther, even faster uh, in order to uh, stay under two degrees. Yes, yes. And of course, every tenth of a degree matters, whatever it turns out to be. So the harms don't just happen if we get to three, four, or five degrees. We're already observing significant harms from climate change. Today, people yes. are harmed. Sea level is already rising. We have sunny day flooding all over. Crop yields are being affected. Wildfire, disease, drought, uh, migration, conflict, all these things are happening today. People are dying from climate change today. Mm -hmm. uh, so every tenth of a degree of warming we can avoid helps preserve prosperity, stability, health, and lives. But That's you just crazy. did what we want people to do with the model, which is, oh, let's see what happens if we vary the assumptions. And yeah, we still have a problem even if we get very, very lucky. All mm -hmm. right, so now, expected warming, a little over 4C, 7.3 Fahrenheit by 2100, unacceptable. So Dan, what are you gonna do to bring that curve down so it's no more than two by 2100? And the options you have are you could tax fossil fuels or regulate them. You could subsidize or promote with market-oriented policies, renewables, nuclear. You could put a price on carbon uh, you could work on the end use side by improving energy efficiency or electrifying transport, buildings, industry and industrial processes. Uh, you can work on land use by changing, reducing deforestation. You could go for the trillion trees 
policy and have an aggressive reforestation afforestation program. You can work on the non-CO2 greenhouse gases, methane, N2O, the fluorinated gases, and you can try a wide range of different carbon dioxide removal, CDR technologies. What would you like to do? Okay, so this is kind of fun. And I know that there's not a magic bullet. There's not going to be one thing that we can start with what slightly you think to... the highest leverage thing might be then. Oh, uh, sorry, we got cut off a little bit there. So I, I don't think there's a magic bullet, right? I don't think there's a single thing that we could turn that would fix everything. Uh, so no, that that's something that... Uh, okay. I, but no, no, I, I don't think there's a magic bullet. But if we were to just try one thing, uh, it would be interesting for me to try just the carbon price to start with, because that's right. something that, you know, you hear people talking about the, uh, about this. So yeah, if we went for a pretty aggressive... So let's uh, try the carbon price. price. Yeah, let's see. And, if that does. Uh, I'll round this off to $75 per ton of CO2. So that's a little higher than what some people talk about. For example, a lot of the oil companies have endorsed a carbon price hmm. of around 40 dollars per ton of CO2. Hmm. Uh, of course, many of them have endorsed it publicly, but still work aggressively to prevent any such legislation from being passed. Hmm. But let's try it out at $75 a ton. So what would that mean before we look at the outcome? So that would be raising the price of gasoline in the United States by about... 66 cents a gallon or thereabouts, hmm. Hmm. which would still leave it far below the level it is in the UK or Europe. Um, it would be a few percent increase uh, in the price of gasoline for you folks. So hmm. what does it do? Uh, it lowered the expected warming from 4.1 C to 3.4. That's right. a huge impact. And of course the model allows us to put in different pathways for the carbon price. Here we're phasing it in over 10 years, but you could continue to increase it after that with different patterns if you want. But let's just keep it simple. That's a very high leverage policy. And you can see what it does. It uh, dramatically constrains coal. You get a little more natural gas being the least carbon intensive fossil fuel. You get a lot more renewables and you're also getting more nuclear. Um, hmm. And so you're decarbonizing the energy system faster, but you're also getting efficiency gains on the end use side as people improve the uh, insulation and quality of the windows in their homes and commercial industrial buildings and so forth. So there's a drop in total energy demand. You can see that right here. Energy demand still grows over the century, but it's much lower because of the enhanced efficiency and uh, CO2 emissions drop off. They're almost flat now, hmm. Uh, hmm. approximately. So that's a very high leverage policy, but it's not enough. We're getting to 3.4. That's still a long way from two. Yes. What else do you want to add to the mix? Well, I noticed, you know, there are, like the UK, for example, has made a commitment to ramp down the kind of net carbon emissions, uh, ideally to, to zero by 2050. Right. So why don't we try ramping down some of the coal use, uh, for example? Uh, do you think we can, so when you, the, the coal lever or the coal uh, slider there, are we basically, is this a policy lever that we would be using to say, decrease the amount of coal that yeah. is available? So this goes beyond the carbon price. This is some sort of legislative, uh, mechanism for saying, well, let's decrease the amount of coal uh, in the investment. Right. So exactly right. So the carbon price does uh, significantly disadvantage coal and you see a big drop off in coal, uh, coal use with the carbon price. But coal is extremely cheap and very abundant. And in many parts of the world, uh, it's the go to energy source still today. So even though coal use is falling today in the developed economies in the US and in the UK and in Europe, for example, new coal plants are still being designed, permitted, 
built and commissioned in mm -hmm. Asia, uh, right. Vietnam, Sri Lanka, funded by the Chinese, funded by the Japanese, etc. China, of course, still heavily coal dependent, even though they're trying to eliminate uh, coal. So uh, you still see some coal. So let's try what you suggested. We can uh, click here and stop building all new coal infrastructure, no new coal-fired power plants, for example, Okay. the yeah, year that you happens. specify. So you tell me what year we should do that. And existing plants would still be there, but no new plants would be built. OK, let's give it a try. What year do you want to do that? Why don't we do it soon? Why don't we do, uh, well, just for fun, why don't we try uh, this year? <laughs> 2020. That's right. probably unrealistic. But. Well, but, you know, that's the purpose of the model. Try what you like. So here mm -hmm. we go. No new coal infrastructure is uh, permitted starting in 2020. And that was also very helpful, even with the carbon price that's already making coal um, unattractive. You get an additional two tenths of a degree of, of uh, reduction in the warming. We're down to 3.2. Now you'll notice that coal doesn't disappear fully until after 2050. Mm -hmm. That's because the existing coal plants stay in operation. And by not building any new ones, but not doing anything else to promote alternatives yet, what do you think happens to the price of energy? Mm -hmm. It's going to rise a little bit above what it would have been, which makes it more attractive to keep those other remaining coal plants in operation longer. Right, right. Uh, and you enrich all the fossil producers at the expense of energy consumers. Mm, okay, so that was really informative then. That was really instructive doing that. Uh, so why don't we try... it absolutely helps, but it also uh, shifts wealth from energy users, ordinary citizens, to the remaining folks who still have existing hmm. coal, oil, and gas capacity. So what else would you like to try? Let's invest in renewables. Let's see if we can get more Great. renewable energy. So um, you'll notice that the wedge of renewables here is already larger than in the base case. So for comparison, here's the base case. Hmm. And you, with your emerging scenario, carbon price, no new coal after 2020. The renewables is a much bigger wedge of primary energy production. Mm, right. But now let's subsidize it or encourage it over and above that. So uh, there's different ways you can do this, of course. Every one of these levers, there's a regulatory approach you could apply. For example, in the coal case, you could simply, nations could pass new regulations saying we, we simply, by law, you can no longer build a, a new coal-fired electric power station um, or open a new mine. Uh, or you could do it with a market-friendly approach, right? So mm -hmm. in the case of the coal, you could say, um, we're going to buy your assets, uh, pay you for the stranded assets that you might have here. And that would be a more market-friendly approach. So we don't take a position regulation versus free market policies. Uh, there are multiple ways to get each of these actions implemented. Uh, and that's an important aspect of the model. We are rigorously nonpartisan in our approach. Mm -hmm. The important thing is helping people learn for themselves about where the high leverage actions are and which, which actions that are popularly discussed really don't matter that much. So mm -hmm. let's, let's encourage renewables. And you can do that with investment tax credits or production tax credits or renewable portfolio standards that mandate that you must have a certain amount of solar and wind, et cetera, in your energy mix. Or you can do it with PACE financing for residential solar, uh, prop property assessed clean energy. Uh, where your community can borrow the money more cheaply than you as an individual homeowner might. And if you're a person of color living in a minority poor neighborhood or anybody living in a poor neighborhood, you don't have any capital. You can't afford to do this. Um, and uh, so these kinds of policies 
would be able to promote renewables. And it, it, uh, it helps. Uh, you get a much bigger wedge of renewables, but it takes a while for that to kick in. Mm -hmm. So it didn't have that much impact on temperature, about a tenth of a degree Fahrenheit. Wow, yeah. Um, and part of the problem is the renewables are generating electricity here, hydro, wind, solar. Uh, and your policies so far still leave us with quite a lot of natural gas and especially quite a large wedge of oil, most of which is mm. going into transportation. So what else right, would you like right. to do? Well, um, a couple of episodes ago, I talked with Scott Denning, who's a climate scientist. And one of the uh, approaches that he mentioned that he's a big fan of is uh, electrification of everything, of transport. So I think yeah. that leads quite nicely on from what you just mentioned. So let's see if we encourage or incentivize electrification of transport in some way, how big of a, an effect does that have? Let's do it. So I'm going to pull that all the way. <laughs> so massive policies to promote electrification of transport. Now in our model, we're only assuming land-based transportation can be electrified. Mm. Water and aviation, we're assuming you can't. Okay. So, okay. You know, there have been some very interesting experiments with uh, electric aircraft, uh, but you know, there's no prospect right now for an electric jumbo jet to right. take us across the ocean. So we're just ruling that out. And it made a substantial difference. It took us from 3.2 down to three. Um, of course, it takes a long time for that to happen. Uh, so the electric share of final energy use and transportation, it grows only very slowly. And that's partly because of the chicken and egg problem with electric vehicles. So nobody wants to buy an electric vehicle unless they're sure they can get charging anytime and anywhere and nobody's going to invest the money in building out ubiquitous charging infrastructure until they're pretty sure there's going to be a market. And that feedback is in the model. It's another one of those human behavior feedbacks. Uh, so you do get substantial electrification, but it takes uh, quite a while for that to happen. And it's worth two tenths of a degree. Now it's only mm -hmm. worth that much because you've decarbonized the electric grid to a great extent with your carbon mm -hmm. price with your ban on coal, new coal construction and with your promotion of renewables. And just to illustrate that, if we go to the reference case here and we electrify to the same degree, it makes almost no difference. Hmm. The reason is, look at the coal wedge, right? So here hmm. we go, base case, heavy electrification of transport. What happens to the electric grid? Hmm. Well, you've done nothing to decarbonize it or penalize coal, so you get a lot more coal. You get more natural gas too, the oil wedge is shrinking, but you're basically eliminating or substituting um, emissions out of tailpipes of cars. You're substituting emissions from smokestacks of coal power. Right, right. That ultimately, you're still burning carbon <laughs> to right. you know to get that uh, transport done. So, so, so it's really interesting. Uh, electrification. Now, what do you want to do about buildings? Building. Building residential well and industrial buildings and processes so why don't we since we tried electrification on transport why don't we pursue energy efficiency on the buildings and industry tab there to see does Great. that make much of an effect so i'm dramatically increasing energy efficiency Ooh. for buildings and industry now what does that mean it means on the margin new construction is going to be much more efficient than it would have been even with your carbon price. And also existing buildings can be retrofitted. Now usually not as much as what would be optimal for new construction. Um, so I'll give you an example. My house is uh, almost 100 years old and it's a traditional New England style stick frame home, meaning the walls are made out of two by four studs and there's about two inches, therefore, it's about three and a half inches of space between the inside the wall. And of course, when the home was built, that was totally uninsulated. Um, if I blow insulation in there, which we have done, 
that'll improve energy efficiency, but not as much as would be optimal. So uh, retrofits happen. There's a lot of buildings in the world. They use a lot of energy and those buildings by and large can be retrofitted. It has a huge effect. We're now down to 2.8 degrees. 2.8, okay. Um, so I think I know what I'd like to try next, if we could. Go for um, it. So I noticed that looking at the greenhouse ga gas net emissions that uh, methane still makes up a pretty big right. part of the of that uh, of those emissions. Uh, so I thought that might be an important place to see if we can reduce uh, methane emissions. Yeah, and yeah. you know, so, methane. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so I'm showing you the graph here of um, of the non CO2 GHG emissions here, and compared to the reference case, you can see that they're lower they more or less flatten out after 2040. That's because with the carbon price, with less coal, with the promotion of renewables and the electrification and energy efficiency, total energy demand is down. Mm -hmm. Total emissions of methane from the energy system, including leakage all the way through the natural gas distribution system is down. And there's less methane uh, being generated from, um, uh, from other related industrial sources and other gases too. But uh, let's try some additional policies here. Uh, so if I pull the slider, I'm reducing the generation of methane, the uh, chlorinated gases and nitrous oxide mm. from both industry and agricultural land use. Uh, and that makes a big difference. Mm. Uh, we're mm. down to 2.4. And of course, you know the reason it makes a big difference. These are very, very powerful greenhouse gases, molecule for molecule, far more powerful than CO2. Yes, yes. So the idea from what I understand is that, yes, per molecules, they contribute much more to the radiative forcing. Uh, it's thought that they're shorter lived in terms of their total exactly. lifetime in the atmosphere. That's right. So, of... so both of those things help you, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Nitrous oxide uh, has a long atmospheric lifetime, but methane has a short lifetime approximately 20 years, much shorter than CO2. So when you cut the emissions of methane, you're not only reducing the flux of methane into the atmospheric stock, but that atmospheric stock decays quicker. So you see a bigger reduction in the stock of methane in the atmosphere, and that drives a larger contribution to the reduction in radiant force. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and since a methane molecule is many times more power, powerful as a warming agent than CO2, you see a big effect from this. So what would that mean in the real world? It means um, reducing leakage from the natural gas production distribution use supply chain all the way from the wellhead to uh, people who are burning natural gas in their homes or to heat buildings or use in industrial processes. It means reducing methane emissions from land use from landfills, for example, capturing that gas, maybe using it to turn a turbine and make electricity, uh, et cetera. These are all things that can be done and they have a big impact, 2.4. What else would you like to do? Okay, well, in the interest of trying a few different, continuing to, to try many different options, even though I don't think it's gonna make a big difference, I am curious about the carbon removal portion and I'm not an expert in this area in terms of how feasible that is, but I think it's, it is something that you hear people talking about and it has a kind of appeal to it because you, know, you can imagine CO2 is such a long lived gas that perhaps at some point we will have to consider uh, using some technological approaches to decreasing the concentration of it in the atmosphere. So it's worth a try, but it would be interesting to see if we you know, implement some carbon removal uh, uh, aspect okay. of the system here to see if that can get us below two because we're not quite there or we? we're still at 2.4 degrees 2 warming. 2.4 expected warming. So that's mm -hmm. you know, roughly a 50% chance. Those aren't great odds. But uh, so the model includes a wide range of uh, carbon dioxide removal CDR technologies. You can uh, try them all together or you can pick, pick ones that you think are more likely to become economic are closer to commercialization. So we have BECS, 
So that's bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. We have DAC, direct air capture. Uh, there's pilot plants around the world, but even the proponents will tell you that the cost today is $200 a ton of CO2. And those are the people who are promoting these businesses. So uh, it might get better, but right now it's not close to commercialization. You have enhanced mineralization and you have agricultural soil sequestration and finally biochar. So which ones are closest to being deployable today? Uh, agricultural practices, yep, yeah, probably. Um, so let's, let's- we try that? Yeah, let's try that. Try that, uh, oops. Uh, and uh, starting today, you can vary the year that you think this is gonna happen, but let's assume we can change some of our ag practices today and, and let's go for half the estimate of the global potential for that. Because you're not gonna get uniform deployment. Um, and mm -hmm. biochar, you know, let's assume that that's feasible today. Uh, we'll try 50% of its potential. And uh, BEX, BEX is something that's not really ready today, but with the carbon price you've put in, let's assume that it becomes economically feasible and we'll go for 50% of its potential. And we're now down to 2.2. So that, that contributed quite a bit. Now, what about DAC and mineralization? Well, let's look at direct air capture. So it's definitely not ready yet. And even at your carbon price, it's not economic. So mm -hmm. why don't we assume that it becomes economic by, well, you tell me what year. 2040. 2040, great. And then what if we could get 50% of its potential? Hmm. And here we go, 50%. And it didn't change the warming very no, much, no, partly no. because you're assuming it's not going to become viable economically until 2040. And we can change that if it happens sooner, even right now today, didn't change the temperature. We're at 2.2, and I can assume the breakthrough in DAC is today still doesn't change things. Mm. Let's, let's drill down and see what's really going on. So here's a graph that shows all the sources of CO2 removal now. Um, and uh, so the purple one is VEX. On top of that, we've got biochar. On top of that, we have ag. And on top of that, we have contribution from DAC. Now we could be wrong about the potential for all these and you can go up to the uh, assumptions and change those. But uh, one of the things you'll notice here is we're getting, adding all of those up, we're getting about eight gigatons a, a year of CO2 being removed from the atmosphere from all of these CDR technologies. And that level is reached by about 2040. Uh, hmm. So that's a lot. But, uh, and you can see in this graph, then we now have a significant wedge of negative emissions. And most of the scenarios, almost all the scenarios that uh, are reported in the IPCC one and a half degree special report from two years ago, they require negative emissions to have any chance of getting under two and certainly towards one and a half. Uh, so we're seeing those negative emissions now uh, but it takes time to build up to that level. The carbon in some of these technologies doesn't stay sequestered forever. So you can increase the flux of carbon into the soils, but bacterial and fungal respiration will release some of that back into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it helps. We got an additional two tenths of a degree of C reduction in warming, mm -hmm. but it's no silver bullet. Right. So, what else would you like to try? <laughs> well, uh, we started near the beginning of the conversation. You were talking about afforestation, right? You're writing this blog post about, about that. Okay. Maybe we should give that a try. And that might give you a nice way to talk about your blog post as well. Right. So, let's plant a trillion trees. Okay. Let's so see. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll pull that afforestation lever all the way over mm. and it's worth a tenth of a degree uh, 
and and so why? So to really see why, because now we've got a scenario with a lot going on. Let's yes. go look at the base case again, and I'll pull that trillion tree lever all the way over. Hmm. It goes from 4.1c to 4. It's worth a tenth of a degree. Right. Uh, a trillion now, trees. Uh, now why? So and uh, you can see it does reduce net emissions because we're getting negative emissions from uh, planting all those new trees. This is the temperature pathway. There's no significant change until the out years of the century. So how come? Well, the first thing is, it just takes a long time to plant all those trees. There's a delay in securing the land. There's another delay in planting the trees. We can change those parameters. And then most importantly, it takes a long time for trees to grow big enough to be removing a lot of carbon. You know, you plant a sapling or a, a, a little tree um, and the amount of carbon in those when you plant them is measured in grams. The next year it's a few grams more, the next year a few grams more. It's not until they're quite large that they have the leaf area to be removing a lot of CO2 every year. And so uh, you can change the assumptions about how long on average it takes trees to grow, the carbon in trees, of course, doesn't stay out of the air forever. Those trees will eventually die, decay, burn, um, or be harvested for bioenergy or pulp and paper or lumber products. And eventually all that carbon will make its way back to the atmosphere. You can change the assumption about that. You can see the tree program is getting you about six gigatons per year by about 2080 because of the slow growth. And that's not nothing, but it's not enough. And it comes too late to make a huge difference. Mm. The other issue is you need an awful lot of land for this. So uh, the blue line here is the land required. And it eventually becomes about twice the total land area of all of India. Now, some wow. folks, like uh, you, you may be familiar with the paper by Baston et al. that was published in Science uh, last year, uh, where they inventoried all what they believe to be all the possible places in the world where you could plant trees, and then estimated how much carbon that would take up if you did. Uh, and that's basically the scenario you see here. Mm -hmm. That paper has been aggressively challenged by many people on multiple grounds, including the land isn't actually available. Um, if you plant forests on some of that land, it would actually reduce the albedo of the earth and contribute to warming, undermine the carbon benefits. Hmm. The trees, um, there isn't enough water. Uh, the trees may not live as long as you believe they will. Hmm. What about poaching and legal logging, et cetera. And what about food production? If you plant trees where land is currently needed or going to be needed for cropland or pasture to feed a population growing towards 11 billion to 100. So these are all active areas of, of debate. Uh, but even if you do plant all these trees, doesn't make a big difference. Yeah. Even if we could plant them, you know, now I'm really being aggressive here. Yeah. I'm assuming you could secure all the land you need instantly in yeah. one year and plant all the trees much, much faster. You know, maybe you can plant all trillion in just five years. It's still only worth another tenth of a degree. And this is every human on earth basically participating in this project. <laughs> which, you know, Planting trees is a wonderful thing to do in many places. Uh, mm -hmm. If we, if we uh, planted a lot more trees in our cities, it would uh, moderate the urban heat island effect. It would contribute to a little more biodiversity in our cities. It would provide shade and opportunities for recreation. And uh, it would help make our cities more beautiful. These are good things to do. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, trees help uh, with uh, the hydrological cycle. They help with pre preventing biodiversity. Now, biodiversity loss. Now, you've got to try to plant 
the trees so that you get a good approximation to the natural forest that was probably there before. A plantation consisting of a monoculture of fast growing species like loblolly pine, that's not going to do it. First of all, it doesn't sequester as much carbon per hectare. And plantations are typically harvested after a couple of rotations, about 30 years, you harvest replant. But that, what do you harvest it for? You harvest it for wood chips for bioenergy, which puts that carbon right back into the air, or for pulp and paper. And most of that carbon pretty quickly goes back into the atmosphere. So plantations are not the way to do it. Uh, and so I think the bottom line on this is in many parts of the world, it's quite important to reforest and, and afforest to plant new trees, but it is no silver bullet. It right. does not solve the climate crisis. And even more interesting, if people believe that it is, uh, it distracts us from what's really important here, which is keeping the fossil carbon in the ground. Right, right. The vast majority of the emissions are coming from burning fossil fuels. Uh, so this has real practical impact. So I work closely with a lot of large corporations and many of them uh, are very aggressive and sincere about reducing their carbon footprints. But if you look closely at their programs, uh, so, for example, Microsoft and Amazon and Apple all have, in the last year announced pretty good programs to reduce the carbon impact of their operations. Um, a lot of renewable energy, a lot of solar, uh, high efficiency. You know, if you go to the new Apple headquarters, it's a very impressive facility on many, many counts, including it's quite efficient and has a huge solar array on the roof. That's all great, but that doesn't get their footprint down to zero. So mm -hmm. all three of those companies, as part of their plan to get towards net zero, they include significant offsets from forestry. Well, it just doesn't add up. Planting trees, as good as it may be, only reduces carbon after many, many decades when the trees mm -hmm. can get large enough. Mm -hmm. But the fossil energy that you're burning today with certainty goes into the atmosphere today and contributes to warming today. Right. So the idea that planting trees offsets your fossil combustion just isn't true. Right. right. And okay. there are other kinds of offsets that you can imagine that would matter more. Mm -hmm. So I have a framework for thinking about offsets that I call AVID plus, A-V-I-D plus. In order to have a legitimate offset, it needs to be additional, meaning it actually has to reduce emissions below what they would have been. It has to be verifiable. It has to be immediate. And it has to be durable. Hmm. And the plus is any offset program you do use, if possible, you should look for opportunities to contribute to other important social and economic needs, hmm. co-benefits, improving health, improving um, jobs, uh, uh, increasing the resilience of our communities. So let's look at forestry from that framework real quickly. Uh, protecting forests from logging or planting trees is sometimes additional and sometimes not you could designate these hectares as being now protected in some sort of a preserve or a new national park. But if you're not protecting enough of your tropical or subtropical or boreal forest, loggers legally or illegally can cut down adjacent tracks. So that would not be additional. Uh, verification is a big issue for forestry offsets. How do you know that they were planted? How do you know they weren't cut down or wiped out in a farm? Immediate, no. Planting trees is clearly not immediate, whereas the uh, fossil fuels you're claiming to offset are immediately going to be putting CO2 in the atmosphere with certainty, whereas your offset would only do so long, uh, long into the future and not for certain. And durability, well, trees don't live forever. Wildfire 
insect pests, disease, water stress, extreme weather, all of these can kill, knock down your trees, and then eventually that carbon goes back in the air. And all of those are getting worse as the climate warms. So forestry offsets are not, uh, they don't meet the requirements for a good offset. A good alternative that does, I believe, would be significantly increasing the energy efficiency of residential commercial structures, and especially low and moderate income housing, especially for the poor, especially for disadvantaged communities, uh, communities of color and other groups. Um, we saw that when we looked at Yeah. And we saw that when we did energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, and we can do energy efficiency for transportation too. Mm -hmm. And there you are at two degrees. Congratulations, you've made a healthier, safer, not safe, but safer world for you, your children, and for all the children. Mm -hmm. well, let's come back to energy efficiency for a minute as an yeah. us. Uh, so I told you my house is about 100 years old and, and so forth. So about five years ago, my wife and I did a deep energy retrofit on our own home. Uh, what that meant was uh, a lot of insulation, including because the walls aren't thick enough to put the optimal amount of insulation inside. We did that, but it's not enough. We added extra insulation to the exterior of all the walls and the roof. We replaced the windows with high performance windows. We uh, completely eliminated the natural gas heating system, ripped it out completely and replaced it with air source heat pumps. Uh, we've got high efficiency appliances, LED lighting everywhere, heat pump, hot water, um, energy recovery ventilation. So we tightened the building envelope by a factor of 10 and the energy recovery ventilation gives us fresh air in all the rooms, but without wasting the energy we've used to heat or cool the home and, uh, and a solar array on the roof. Uh, and we've now got five full years of experience. And over those five years, we have made almost 50% more energy than we use with no fossil fuels. And the payback time is quite short because uh, we did it in the context of a renovation that the house needed to have done anyway. Hmm. And there's co-benefits for us as well. The house is now far more comfortable. It's actually larger because having ripped out the old heating system and the radiators, each room is now bigger than it was before in terms of usable space. It's a lot quieter because all that extra insulation filters out more noise from the street um, and so forth. So, and maintenance is a lot lower. And so I have no electric bill, no natural gas bill, no bill for heating and cooling. And uh, the surplus is so big that my electric utility owes us more than $4,000. So the next step in our journey is electric vehicles. But since I'm a bicycle commuter, I'm not going to start driving even if I got an electric car. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, donating that surplus to, uh, to organizations in my town who need it. So I was able to do that because, you know, quite frankly, MIT professors are affluent people. But what about somebody who's living in a uh, low income housing unit in an apartment? Uh, they don't have the money to do what I did. And anyway, you've got what we call the landlord tenant problem, which in economics is an agency, principal agent problem. Uh, and that arises because most tenants are paying their own utility bills. So they would benefit a lot from insulation, better windows, high efficiency appliances, a new heating system, mm. but the landlord would have to pay for those things. Mm. And so the landlord pays, gets no benefit, consumer gets the benefit, but doesn't control the system. So it doesn't happen. Uh, so that's a market failure. And if that can be overcome and the capital can be provided to do these deep energy retrofits, especially in low income housing, there's a tremendous potential for emissions reductions, for reductions in energy use, and for co-benefits. And if you think about the framework we just discussed, um, 
these kinds of energy retrofits for low income and moderate income housing are additional because the poor can't afford to do it without some sort of assistance or policy or, or um, change in uh, contracts between landlords and tenants. So it would be additional. It's verifiable because you know when those energy retrofits are done, you can compare the uh, energy consumption after to before. They're immediate, it takes a year or so to do these projects. So they're immediate, not like uh, planting trees and they're durable. Uh, we've extended the life of our house here probably many, many, many decades by doing what we did. That's great. And there's a big plus. The plus is, especially for the poor, and this has been done in places around the world, in the UK, in New Zealand, and in this country here, uh, when you do this, the poor no longer have to choose at the end of every month when their money has run out. They don't have to choose anymore between heating and eating. Every winter in the UK, in the cold part of the United States, anywhere where it's cold in the winter, the poor have to choose between heating and eating. And we know what they're gonna do, you gotta eat. So we know what happens. They turn the thermostat down to as low as it goes and they wear parkas and hats and mittens in their own apartments. Hmm. But it's not enough, they still suffer from bronchitis and pneumonia and uh, acute attacks of COPD at a far higher rate and they show up in the emergency room and they get treated at high cost, but their health is degraded. Their mm. kids don't do as well in school. The parents might be at risk of losing their jobs because if they or their kids get sick, they can't show up and they're likely to be fired. And so when you do this, when you do a deep energy retrofit on low income housing, all of a sudden, people can turn that thermostat up to a normal temperature, still have lower utility bills. So there's more income in their pocket. They don't have to choose between heating and eating. The house mm -hmm. is warmer, more comfortable, safer. And the incidence of these uh, acute health problems, the pneumonias and the bronchitis, et cetera, goes down, which improves the quality of their lives, improves their life outcomes and lowers healthcare costs. So there's a tremendous array of co-benefits that arise from offsets that would improve the energy efficiency of low and moderate income housing. Uh, that's a huge opportunity for emissions reductions and it's also a huge business opportunity. And there's startups in various parts of the world now that are stepping into that market. Uh, it's like an escrow that offers you a PPA for a solar installation. Uh, they'll come into your building and uh, if the landlord agrees, um, they'll replace the old inefficient fossil powered heating system with um, heat pumps and potentially upgrade the insulation and windows and appliances and so forth. And then they get a chunk of the savings and then the landlord and the tenants get a chunk of the savings. Mm. These are both huge opportunities for reducing emissions, but also uh, profitable businesses and improving the health and welfare of the folks in our society who have contributed the least to the climate problem because the poor don't use as much fossil energy as the affluent, mm. uh, but are suffering the most from it. Do you mind, I might, um, that, that's really good, by the way, thank you for that. I might stop the, the video sharing part to see if we get a little bit better bandwidth. Oh, sure. Uh, unless there was another bit we wanted to talk about there. No, I uh, think, you know, you did a, you did a great job. You've, you've, <laughs> uh, you've now got a scenario that uh, limits the expected warming to two degrees and you did it without any technological magic. Hmm. You, you didn't assume fusion suddenly becomes possible or or direct air capture you know suddenly becomes uh, mm. economically attractive uh, or that there's some other magical breakthrough now you know I'm an MIT professor I love technology innovation is great we're going to need every every bit of technological 
savvy and innovation we can to address this challenge and the other challenges of sustainability in our society. But it's not a strategy to count on a breakthrough. Breakthroughs cannot be scheduled. Yes. And what you've done is you've discovered one scenario, and it's not the only one, but one scenario that keeps the fossil carbon in the ground, dramatically improves energy efficiency, uh, reduces emissions from the methane, nitrous oxide, and the fluorinated gases, uh, does it with policies that we can implement today, mm -hmm. price on carbon, reduce or eliminate new coal development, promote renewables, promote energy efficiency, electrify end use. These are all things that can be done today, no magic required. Uh, that's really important, what you've discovered here. It means that this is still possible from a physical, technical, economic point of view. Yes. But there's no one silver bullet. Instead, what you've got here is uh, multiple things need to happen. Mm -hmm. They need to happen quickly. You've got a silver buckshot strategy, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, mm. and this is, this is a, a very important insight. I'll do one more thing, uh, which is this button up here. You can copy the scenario you just did, and I'm going to paste it into the chat here. Oh, great. So now if you click on that link, it'll take you immediately to what you're seeing on my screen, the scenario you've just created. And you can tweet it out and share it on social media with your colleagues and friends and family. And they can say, that's a great scenario, Dan. Or they can say, no, I don't like that. You know, I like <laughs> nuclear or I want something else. Or you don't have enough electrification of the uh, building sector or uh, whatever it might be. And they can build on, criticize, enhance your scenario and share it around. Oh, that's great. Thank you for that. 